got the most dapper pastor and first lady. Man, I, I tell you, the pastor dapper first lady is gorgeous. They, just a loving couple. Let's give God praise for your pastor. And for all of you who are leaders here, it is always good to be back here with you. For members of this congregation, I greet you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. He is Lord. He is Savior. He is risen indeed. Amen. Amen. If you would, just high five three people and tell them it's good to be with you tonight. Tell them it's good to be with you tonight. Praise the Lord. Y'all glad to be alive tonight. Everybody happy? Y'all happy in Jesus? Y'all can be seated in Jesus' name. To God be the glory. We are yet in the land of the living. Amen. And no matter how bad you think it might be, somebody has it worse off. And so... We give God praise. Man, you said you had a stroke. Ain't no evidence, brother. Our God is an awesome God. Amen. Come on, give God praise for healing. Wow. 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 I want to just, uh, just take a moment first to just thank uh, Pastor and First Lady for uh, the opportunity to be back here again. I, I want to, uh, by way of just blessing you all tonight. I want whatever it is that you all are partnering in ministry for this year, uh, let me know at some point so that I can make a donation uh, in agreement with you all for a ministry that you're working toward helping. Amen? Amen? I'd like to do that tonight to find some way to sow into something that is important for the two of you. Amen? Amen. Uh, when you all did that, y'all call that a roll-in. It, it said 36 years. Well, Pastor Yvonne and I are going to be celebrating 40 in December. So, she, Pastor Yvonne's not able to be with me tonight. She uh, was working, and then she had a doctor's appointment, and she would have been rushing to get home. And, you know, my wife works hard. I said, baby, you you take a minute, and, and just for yourself, you you take it easy, you know, and and we've got to do that for one another. We have to, you know, because Pastor Yvonne encourages me when, when I'm going through, you know. You know, I don't know if y'all understand how under attack shepherds can be. You know, we'll stand up and, and share with you, but sometimes the devil is busy. I don't know if you knew since the last time we were together, uh, our oldest son went to be with the Lord. Our oldest son, Steve. Uh, just, it's been about two years, I think, since I've been here, but our oldest son, Steve, he had been on dialysis for a number of years. Um, he had been diagnosed uh, when he was in high school uh, with uh, spilling creatinine. Uh, creatinine. He um, had just had a simple uh, blood test, a urine test, trying out for high school football, freshman football. And for years, Steve uh, labored with that. You would have never known Steve was going through any challenges. Um, Steve, Steve was my, he was my go-to man. When, when we were setting up church and we'd have to set up and break down, it was Steve who was loading chairs into his car and he was doing, he'd get out of the hospital and be right in church on Sunday morning and God knows we miss him, but I, I know he is in the presence of the Lord and he is, he is out of pain and out of suffering. But, you know, just by way of catching, catching you up on life. life, life happens, but you learn how to take a lick in and you learn how to keep right on ticking. Amen? You, you learn how to keep praising God, not giving the devil any room for victory. Yeah, sometimes you might be challenged, but you don't ever let the devil see you sweat. You keep, you keep right on keeping on. Amen? You know, I, I was listening to uh, Pastor Dennis and Pastor Phil, and Pastor, oh, you're right, there's some shoes to fill, but I, I'm glad that Jesus is Lord. All I got to do, I just got to be here and leave it up to Jesus. And, you know, it's, it's just good to be able to come off of the battlefield and come into a place where you can be refreshed. You say, well, Pastor, you're preaching. How can you be refreshed? It's just refreshing to be among the saints, right, and, and to be in the presence of the Lord. It, that is refreshing. 
I, I want to thank Sister Maria for helping me out today. Uh, sound team, uh, uh, sight people, are we good with uh, the, uh, yes, we're good. Oh, Y'all good, yeah, yeah. All right, all right. So we're, we're good. They're, they're going to work with me tonight. You know, Wednesday night, uh, I usually am teaching Bible study. So tonight I wanted to not only uh, preach, but I wanted to just do some teaching because I think it's important we can shout, but if we don't know why we're shouting and we don't get a good understanding of the word, and I know Pastor O is a teacher, he wants you to have an understanding of the word, and you all are celebrating living in Christ. So I wanted to talk with you about living in Christ, a fresh start. I, I know that might be a little small because for these eyes, that's small, but if y'all can see it, you know, and this was mine, and I'm not blaming the sound or the psych team, that was, they took what I gave them and, and tried to work with it. So tonight we're just going to look at what has been the theme of your uh, consecration week. Uh, out of 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 5, if you've got your Bible handy, hold it up. Let's say this together. Say this with me. This is my Bible. I read it. I believe it. I act on it. I am what it says I am. I can do what it says I can do. I can have what it says I can have. Now, you got to look at somebody and smile real pretty at them real handsomely and say, say to them, and neighbor, you are, you are a success. Tell them you are a success. You are a saint under Christ's command, enjoying supernatural supply through the word of God. Can somebody say amen? Amen. amen. Lord, let the words of my mouth, let the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight. O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Amen. Yeah, we're getting away uh, at the end of December, at the end of uh, November, into the beginning of December. Pastor Yvonne and I are just going to go cruising for a while. I know y'all going to be cruising shortly, and we wanted to be with you all on that, but we're celebrating 40, and I wanted to just make sure we did something really, really nice, and, and I just let Pastor Yvonne... She, she loves that being out on the water. I didn't think I was going to like it. I thought I was going to be confined out there. But after I did a little three-day tour a few years back. I, it was lovely. Then I went on a week, and that was even lovelier. And Pastor Yvonne loved Disney cruising. She, she, just, she gets to be a little girl again, and I get to be a young man again. And yes, and we just rollick and have fun, and... So, so we're going to take a couple of weeks and just enjoy one another. Forty years, you know, it has gone by so quick. I, I kind of look back and I say, where did 40 years go? But I look at my kids and I say, yep, that's where it went. It went that year, that year, that year. Yep, that's, I know exactly where it went. But Pastor Yvonne, I am, I am blessed to have someone to put up with me for 40 years, you know, Lord Jesus, it was enough that the Lord put up with me, but he sent me, sent me Pastor Yvonne, and she has just been the joy of my life, and I, I appreciate her, and I appreciate all that she is and who she is to me. Uh, you know, in the, in the book of 2 Corinthians, it says this, uh, in, starting with verse number 16, Wherefore, henceforth, we know no one after the flesh. Yea, we knew Christ after the flesh, but even now we know him no more after the flesh. Therefore, if anyone be in Christ, they are a new creature. All things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. And all things are of God who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation. Therefore, God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Now, this is a verse I like because this is where our church got named from. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ. As though God did beseech you by us, we pray you in Christ's stead, be reconciled to God. For he made him to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made righteousness of God in him. 
I like to try to locate us during Holy Week because y'all know this is Holy Week. It's uh, Holy Wednesday. I like to try to locate us in the life of the greater Christian community. And you know, historically on Wednesday night, it, this was the night that Judas decided that for 30 pieces of silver, about $600, he decided that he was going to betray Jesus. He, he decided that it was the worst he could have been, that the worst person Judas could have ever been in betraying Jesus for 30 pieces of silver. But the same guy who was at the worst of times criticized a woman for breaking an expensive alabaster jar and anointing Jesus with it. He accused her of having done the worst possible thing when in reality she had done the best possible thing. But you know it is like that. What you do that is right will often by the world be considered wrong and what is done by the world that is wrong will be considered right. But if God be for you, who can be against you? I didn't really come to do anything more tonight than just advance the ball a few more yards. Amen. Pastor Dennis put emphasis on being in Christ. Pastor Phil told us to king up. <laughs> YouTube is a wonderful thing. I, I couldn't be here, but I wanted to at least flow in the anointing. I, I don't want to score any touchdowns. I just want to advance. Because King Jesus has already scored the winning touchdown. But if I can help the team here at Harmony advance to get another first down, we are still in the game. Touch somebody and tell them, just get another first down. Just get, just get another first down. See, too many times we're trying to win the whole game when what you really need to do is just go after it yard by yard. So, so 2 Corinthians was written because Paul needed to address a need for reconciliation. Isn't it a terrible thing when church folk ain't getting along? Paul wrote 2 Corinthians because, you know, 1 Corinthians, he, he dealt with a church that had so many gifts. But with all their giftings, they were whacked out. You know, you can be brilliant and be wacky. You can have all kinds of gifting and never really make an impact. And the church at Corinth had all these gifts all these talents, but they were acting crazy. They were coming for communion, and they was eating up the communion like they hadn't had dinner. Like, no, like nobody had cooked a hamburger. Nobody had gone to Smash Burger, McDonald's, Burger King. They came in, and they wanted it their way. They wanted to eat all the communion and then drink all the wine. So Paul had to bring correction. But in bringing correction, you know, some folk can take correction and they can woman up or man up and take it and do better. Other folk, when they get corrected, they get an attitude, they get long in the face, they get upset, they get mad. Paul was dealing with that. So, so he was trying to, in 2 Corinthians, restore the relationship. He said, I'm not going to come to you right now because if I come see you right now, it just might aggravate things. And I don't want to aggravate. I want us to be able to get along. You know, sometimes you got to have a cooling off period. You don't get to 40 years without having had a moment or two of intense fellowship. <laughs> now, y'all don't have to acknowledge that y'all ain't never had no intense fellowship. I, but sometimes you got to just call. Here, here's the thing about time out. Don't call time out and never go back and address it. 
When you call time out, now, now I want to just deal with, when you call time out, make sure that you establish a time that you're going to get back in it and work it through. Amen? If not, you will give the enemy a foothold in your relationship because you've not been willing to get back into it. So Paul said, I'm not coming yet, but I will be there. Second, Paul writes Corinthians to tell the church that they need to be true to their obligation to help the Jewish Christians. See, the Gentile Christians, they were loaded. They had some bread. They, they had some shorts. They, they had some money. And Paul was challenging them to support those who didn't have what they had. He said, I'm going to be coming, and I want you to have the offering right. You know, you know, it's something when you can give to somebody else, when you can be a blessing in somebody else's life. You may have, it's good for you to have it. God gives it to you so you can share with others. Give God a praise for sharing. But the third thing Paul had to deal with at the very end of 2 Corinthians was super preachers. Paul was saying that they're, these super preachers are creating too much confusion in the church. See, super preachers will cause regular church folk to get whacked out because their theology can differ from where you are in a local church. And if all you see is somebody on TV, but you're never connected to a local body, you are missing the fellowship of what a, you can't be a bedside Baptist all your life. It just won't work. And these super preachers were encouraging confusion. Paul says we've got to work through that. So, so let me hone down. You all understand where we are, and I'm trying to help you understand where we are in 2 Corinthians. But now let's hone down into chapter 5. Uh, in chapter 5, Paul is teaching them about their existence in the world to come. He says, though this tabernacle be destroyed, we have a building not made with hands. He then goes on to say, we walk by faith and not by sight. He says, we're longing for a heavenly body, but we've got to deal with being in an earthly suit. He says, the aim of our life is ought, it ought to be looked at in light of our destiny. See, let me put it to you this way. There is a direct correlation between where you aim and where you go. There's a direct correlation between where you aim and where you go. If you aim low, you're going to go low. If you aim high, you're going to go high. It's a proven fact that uh, there was a study done with students in school. And uh, they told one group of kids that you just don't have the intellectual ability to accomplish anything. They told another group of kids that you've got the intellectual ability to go as far as you want. What they didn't tell the kids was that both groups was the exact opposite. They told the kids who really didn't have a lot they could go far. And they told the ones who had a lot that you wouldn't go nowhere. And guess what? True to what they taught them is how their lives went. You know, I, Pastor O gave up his motorcycle, but I still ride, right? And uh, it's, my, it's my enjoyment. It's what I get out and relax. I get out there on that thing and just go. But here's the thing. When you're making a turn on a motorcycle, you can't look where you've been. you got to look where you're going. In other words, when you're riding a motorcycle, your head turns where you're going before you ever get there. So it is in life. Where you are looking is where you're going to end up. Where you aim has a direct correlation to where you're going. Um, we have been commissioned. Say this with me. I've been commissioned to be an ambassador for Christ. Can you bring up that slide that had the uh, word uh, kinos on it? 
uh, that first slide with the scripture and the word uh, kainos on it. We're going to get into those uh, slides now. I want you to see something. I, I, uh, next slide, please, brother. Next slide. Y'all bear with me because I, I wanted to try to do this, and I'm hoping it's going to work for us. Ne next slide. Yep, there it is. All right, now y'all may not be able to see this. Maybe those of you in the front can. But what it says is it gives us a definition of the word new. Because Paul says, if anyone be in Christ, they are a new creature. But I don't want you to see that word new and miss new. You may think new means just new straight out of the box. That's not what this new means that uh, Paul is writing about. The new that he's talking about, he's talking about the substance of who you are. Not what you look like, but what is on the inside of you. If anyone be in Christ, they are a new creature. What does that mean? They are of a new kind. It is unprecedented. It is novel. It is uncommon. It ain't been heard of before. Did you hear me? Um, in other words, he's not just saying that you've been mended to, make, to be looked like new. Uh, some of y'all are young enough to remember when you had jeans, you would tear your jeans and mama would put on a patch. She would iron a patch on the knee. Now kids pay $200 to wear them with the tears. We were trying to get them patched up so they didn't look trifling. But a patch, when it is in the washing machine, starts to pull the rest of the jeans. So you walk around with a patch, but it's puckered all around. The Bible says you don't put new wine into old wine skins. Because the new wine in the fermenting process, it will burst the old wine skin. See, it is something new, something unprecedented, something uncommon, something never seen before. Huh. Somebody shout, God is doing a new thing. No, tell somebody he's doing a never done before thing. In other words, in other words, we are now right with God. You ever owed somebody some money, and when you finally paid them, they said, all right, we square now. Everything is right. Right, right, that's, that we square now. We are square now with God. In Christ, we are new creatures. But somebody in here is saying, you know, Pastor, I hear you, but I just can't see it. Because I didn't do anything to make this right. Uh, I want to bring up a couple of slides. I want you to see this. First slide um, with the numbers. Um, no, one more. Yeah, right there. Right there. Y'all read it. I want you to help, with, help you to see what you won't normally see. It says, what's it say? That ain't what it says. Where's the mistake? <laughs> see, you didn't see it until I showed it to you, right? Some of you may have caught it and said, you know what? There's two thes there. Everybody be looking. Oh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. <laughs> one, two, three. Eight, that's right. Can you find the mistake? Mistake is bold. So did they spell mistake wrong? No, it's spelled right. But if you hadn't been looking or somebody hadn't said, there's two thes in there, you'd have never found. Can you see it now? Next one, next one. What do you see? Let's have some fun tonight while we're learning the word. What do you see tonight? You see what? You see Amazon. What else do you see? You see, you, somebody said, see a smiley face? Okay, yeah, you see a smiley. What, what, how do you see it? 
How do you see a smiley face? It, it, it looks like a smile, right? It makes you feel good when you see it, but there's something else going on there. Do you see anything else? See, see, Paul says, Paul says that we are new creatures. And some of y'all are thinking, I can't see that in me. And I'm trying to draw some parallels so you can see what you don't see. Look at somebody tell them you can see what you don't see. Do you see the arrow going from where? From A to Z. In other words, Amazon covers everything from A to Z. I'm helping you to see what you didn't see. Next one. Next one. Next one. This is Goodwill's logo. What do you see? Uh huh? Now y'all starting to investigate. Now, now y'all are looking. Now y'all looking with a discerning eye. See, see, see. That's good because when it comes to spiritual matters, you got to start looking at yourself with a discerning eye. You got to inspect what God is doing more deeply. Yeah. So up in the corner, somebody said over here it's a smiley face. Other folks said, well, maybe it's a G. For goodwill. Oh, I see it now. Next one, please. I have to give them a minute because I had to break this up for them. I'm, I'm not going to go long tonight either. I'm gonna, we're going to stop real in a little bit of while. Part two, there it is. This is familiar. Can you see what you don't see? I don't even know what I'm supposed to be looking for. How can I see what I don't see if I don't know what I'm looking for? <laughs> can you see anything? <laughs> do y'all do y'all see anything? Y'all see FedEx, most of you. How many of y'all see FedEx? If y'all don't, let me hear. hear <laughs> y'all see FedEx? But as the brother said over here, you see EX in orange? Do you see the arrow between the E and the X? You'll never look at FedEx the same way again. What a, what a, FedEx did that because it meant they were always on the move. They were always going to get the job done. You see it, but you don't. Do y'all see it now? Can y'all see a little more clearly now? Uh, I think we got another one. What do you see? What do you see? <laughs> this, this side of the room anointed. Yeah, they sitting behind Pastor O. They, they anointed over here. <laughs> what y'all see? You say, why is, Pat, why is he doing this with us? Because if you, if you will start discerning the word, you will understand that God is doing something new in you, something that's never been done before. It is unprecedented. And if you don't know what you're looking at, so is that guy looking at me or is he looking at you? All right, one more, one more. What y'all see? <laughs> y'all starting to think now, right? Y'all y'all into this now, yeah. We catching it now, Pastor. All right, all right, last one, last one. Oh, let's go back to that one real quick. So that was either, you're either seeing a vase or you're seeing the outline of two faces, right? 
All right, next one. Now, now this one you might not be able to see as well, but um, here's what it says. One, one guy in the very front, he says, it's a spear. The other guy that's riding up on top of that mound says, it's a fan. The guy on the ladder, he says, well, it's a wall. The guy that's holding on to the trunk said, it's a snake. The person holding on to the leg said, it's a tree. The one that's got it by the tail said, it's a rope. It really ain't none of them. But because they are so close up on it, they can't see it. You know, sometimes you can be so close up on a problem that you can't see God trying to give you the answer to your problem because you got to get back and fly up in the air where you can get some perspective. Um, he says, Paul says, God is going to do and is doing in Christ something new that's never been done before. This is something that's never been done before. Do you remember when they first came out, there was a great big bag, and you were walking around with a great big bag on your arm? You remember an antenna? If you had one in your car, you remember how big it was sitting in the car? Now, I got to watch that if I ain't careful, and if I say, hey, Siri, it's going to say, yes, can I help you? Something that's never, never seen it before. The Williams sisters, Venus and Serena, came into the game of tennis and change the game in a way that's never been seen before. They had to change the rules of the game. Touch three people and tell them God made you to be a game changer. God made you to be a game changer. Tell them God made you to be a game. <laughs> Give God a praise that you're a game when you show up, the whole game. <laughs> Don't you remember Satan thought he had won the game on Good Friday? He thought he had won the game. <laughs> he was sitting around high-fiving and boasting. <laughs> Some of y'all, I want to tell you tonight, you might feel like you're at a bad Friday in your life. But touch your neighbor and tell him, but Easter Sunday's coming. Tell him, Resurrection Sunday is coming. Just like Jesus got up out the grave, he changed the whole game. Give God a praise that Jesus. Now, now, so I first wanted you to see what you couldn't see. Because when you can start seeing what you couldn't see, you can start believing what you couldn't believe. Now that you've seen that you can see things a different way, you can begin to think a different way. Romans 12 says, be ye transformed by the what? There's that word again, new, but it's got re in front of it. Re means again. See, your mind was new before the fall. So when Jesus came, he again made your mind new. He renewed. Uh-huh. Proverbs says, as a person thinketh in their heart, so are they. Now, I want you to begin just tonight. I know I got to preach because we're getting there. 
I want you to begin to think a little bit about seeing yourself in a different way. Paul says in verse number 16 of chapter 5, 2 Corinthians, we know no one after the flesh. Paul said we made that mistake with Jesus. We, we thought we knew him because we were looking at him according to the flesh. He said we made that mistake and it cost us. He says don't know Jesus after the flesh, but more importantly, don't know anyone next to you after the flesh. See, when you know people after the flesh, it loses a spirit of familiarity. And that spirit of familiarity comes in the relationship to cause tension and division. Know no one after the flesh. Because when you start knowing people after the flesh, you start thinking you're God over their life. You start thinking, oh, I know who they are. I know what they've done. I know where they've been. That's what they did with Jesus. Isn't that Mary's son? Isn't that Joseph's boy? A carpenter? It was a spirit of familiarity. It's deadly in the church. When you start getting too common with one another, there always has to be a level of godly respect among us. Because when we have that godly respect, familiarity doesn't, doesn't jump in. Oh, yeah, I knew them. I knew them. We was in the club together. Yeah, I knew them. We was out under the blue light together. I know them. The Bible says don't know anyone. If anyone be in Christ, who you are seeing is not who they used to be. Who you, you're seeing a body, but the word says we are changed from the inside. The Bible says you shall know the truth, and the truth will what? Um, slide number 10. Can you bring that one up for me, fellas? When you know the truth, it gives you the power to see what you couldn't see before. Uh, next one. Yep, yep, yep. This one. This one. What am I asking you to do tonight? Oh, you can bring it back up for me, brothers, please. I, I, I'm sorry. I know y'all trying to do this for YouTube, but um, they should have been here tonight. <laughs> <laughs> this, that, that box, one of the X's was outside of the box. You have to understand that God wants to do some out-of-the-box things in your life. God wants to do some stuff that in your mind you could not conceive how that could ever happen for you. You may not have the intelligence, you may not have the wherewithal, but God ain't concerned about what you got. He's concerned that you are concerned about what he's got. Because he's got everything. Tap three people and tell them everything you need, God's got it. I got to hurry. Let me give you this illustration. Let me give you. Y'all remember Roger Bannister? Do y'all remember Roger Bannister? I'm telling you to think outside the box. Roger Bannister was an English runner. He ran the mile. Ran a, the, the mile uh, distance, the race, four times around the track. He set the record that changed all of anyone else who ever ran the mile relay. Before Roger Bannister, they had never run the mile under four minutes. Everybody who ran it thought that running it at four minutes was an impossibility. You can do four, but you can't ever do under. They thought the weather conditions had to be just right. Had to be a sunny day. 
No humidity in the atmosphere. Had to be a beautiful, spectacular day. Roger Bannister on a cold day, a cold, misty day, at a high altitude, ran a three-plus-minute mile. The first person to run under four minutes. You may say, well, wow, that's cool for him. But everybody that ran with him also broke the four-minute mile. <laughs> what am I trying to say? I'm trying to say to you that if you'll be a game changer, everybody in your family will get blessed. Everybody in your neighborhood will get blessed. Everybody will run. Give God a praise that you can. Come on, y'all got to give God a crazy. So not only did he break the four-minute mile, but everybody running with him. Bro what am I trying to tell you? I came tonight to try to help us break a four-minute spiritual mile so that not only do I get victory, but all of you get victory. Okay, okay, let me keep going. Let me keep going. If anyone is in Christ... They are a new creature. Say the same form. Same ashy elbows. Same ashy knees. Same rough heels. But on the inside, a brand new being. Say, in spite of my shortcomings. In spite of my fears, in spite of my mistakes, despite all of that, I am a new creature in Christ. Now, now, check this. Because everybody thinks it was cool when God made the universe. Because God took nothing and made the entire world. He put the stars in place, the moon, the sun. Put everything in place. That was cool. He brought it out of nothing and made something out of nothing. But as cool as that was, you know what was even cooler? What was even more fly? What was even more all that and a bag of chips? That he took us with our jacked up wills, with our stubborn way of acting, with our foolishness that we bring to him, he changed us in spite, in spite of it. Give God a praise, cause you're the real miracle. Despite our bend towards sin, God straightened us up and put us on a new path. Despite where we missed it, God turned our mistakes into blessings. I heard this brother say, I thought he had peeped my sermon. He said, he said, your DNA changes. And I wrote, it is such a radical change that even our DNA is affected by it. What do you mean by that? When it changes your DNA, when this being new in Christ, when you really get a hold to it, it breaks generational curses off of your life. It breaks generational sicknesses off of your life. It breaks alcohol off of your life. It breaks fornication off My daddy was a rolling stone. Wherever Papa laid his hat. But when Jesus saved me, he changed my whole DNA. I've been married 40 years, but Papa was a rope.
touch your neighbor and tell them that generational curse is breaking. That generational curse is breaking. Oh, slide number 11. I got to hurry. Slide number 11. Got to catch this. Catch this. Slide number 11. There he is. What do y'all see? Remember I told you, when you are in Christ, you are a game changer. You do what can't be done by anyone else. I ain't just saying this. I'm telling you what the scripture is unfolding in that word, kinos. You are a new kind of creature. It is supposedly theoretically proven that a bumblebee ain't supposed to fly. In relation to its body, its wings are too small. In relation to trying to fly, it can't get enough upward motion to lift its body. Would somebody please tell that bumblebee that it ain't supposed to fly? Because that bumblebee ain't worried about what none of y'all think about whether it can fly. Every day it gets up, flutters its wings. What am I trying to say to you? Don't worry about what folks said you can't do. I can do all things through Christ who... If God be for me... Touch your neighbor and tell him you can fly. You can fly. <laughs> if a bumblebee can fly, if a bumblebee can do it, you can do it. What am I trying to get you to see? That you are a new creature. You are in a different class. You're not in the human class any longer. You are in the God-man class. You've got divinity flowing through your system. you got God. Somebody say yes. But not only are we in Christ, Christ give God a praise that He's in us. Oh, oh, um, here's where it starts to get deep. Because I've been talking to you about seeing. I've been talking to you about thinking. Now you know what I'm going to talk to you about? Acting. <laughs> seeing, thinking, now action. Because the theme for this week is living in Christ. That's an action word. It says living. Not life in Christ, but living in Christ. See, God wants you to enjoy life. See, we get saved and think that all the fun's supposed to be out of life. The devil is a liar. I'm going to let drug dealers and pimps and all kind of folk that ain't studying God have more fun in God's world than me? I don't think so. I told Pastor, oh, after I'm done tonight, can I borrow the keys for about five minutes? I just want to open it up and go down the road and shift it one time. And <laughs> Life is meant to be lived. The world ought not have more fun than believers have. We ought to have all kind of godly enjoyment. Here, but you got to do this. Live it one day. I I'm going to slow down for a minute here. Because too many times we live life looking for tomorrow. 
looking for next week, next year. We do all that and miss. One of my biggest regrets as a pastor is that I spent so much time pastoring other folk that I didn't spend as much time as I could have pastoring my own kids. That's one of my, one of my things that, you know, I always, um, I, I understand it, but I can't let the devil use that to hold me hostage. I'm going to get to that in just a minute. Don't let me get ahead of myself. I want, I want you to live life one day Get the most out of the day. Here, here, do this. Just turn to your neighbor and say to them, neighbor, I'm so glad I'm sitting next to you tonight. Just make them feel good. I'm so glad you're sitting here tonight, sister. Yes, I'm glad you're sitting here tonight. Live life one day at a time. Get, get the most out of today. By the time we're done tonight, you're going to have three or four more hours to pack in some more fun. Get the most that you can. You know, you know now, now in, 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 in the yards are starting to wake up, grass is growing. But you know what else is growing? Weeds. Grass is growing, but weeds are growing too. If you're going to take action, you've got to start getting the weeds out of your life. The things that cause you distress, get rid of them. Some of the stuff that's in our life is nothing more than a weed. See, the challenge is to discipline yourself enough to take off the old man and put on the new. That's, that's the challenge. Now, I, I'm going to bring this person up, and, you know, you may have your own thoughts about him, but he gives us a clear illustration of discipline. Sunday, I got home thinking I was going to catch the end of the Masters. It was already played. I watched the repeat to find out that Tiger had won another Masters. Now, I, what you think about him, I can't, that, that's your opinion. But what I do know is that despite all of his mistakes, despite everything that he messed up, he figured out a way to right himself and win. So I came to tell you tonight, Despite the mistakes that you've made in life. <laughs> I'm preaching to myself now. Despite the stuff that you missed. Despite the places that you didn't get it done like you wanted to get it done. Write yourself. Discipline yourself. Put on the new man. And say, if anyone be in Christ, they are new creature. The old is passed away. Come on, give God. I got to hurry. Slide number 11. Next slide. Next slide. Next slide. Both of those glasses are filled to the same capacity. It's coming back. There it is. Your attitude is going to determine your altitude. If you don't pull your attitude up, your altitude is always going to be low. When the devil gets on your track and tries to make you put your attitude down, that's when you got to pull your Grab a hold of the wheel of your life and pull up, baby. Pull up. Pull up on your life. So what's the difference between the two glasses? Ain't nothing different about the two glasses. 
What's different? How you see it. This is what theologians call the already, but not yet. We are already new in Christ, but we not yet walking in it. We are already redeemed people, but we're not yet perfect at it. But the Bible says, don't worry about the not yet. By faith, call those things that be not as though they Somebody say, already, already. but not yet. <laughs> you remember Jesus had a blind man? And the blind man came to Jesus and wanted to get healed. And Jesus spit, put some mud together, slapped it on his eyes. It was already, but not yet. Jesus said to the man, what do you see? The man said, I see, but people look like trees. Here's a good lesson. Even Jesus had to go back a second time. If Jesus went back a second time, what keeps you from going back a third time, a fourth time, a hundredth time? I don't matter how many times that problem has beset you. If God before you, who can be against you? Get after it with everything you've got. The man said, I see, but they look like trees. Jesus spit again made some mud, rubbed it in the man's eyes. Some of y'all grossed out right there. <laughs> I'm thinking, Jesus, you do whatever you need to do to get me healed. Whatever you got to do to get me healed. Verse 21, and I'm almost done. Verse 21 says this. Verse 21 in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21. It says that God made an exchange. Him who knew no sin became sin that we might become the righteousness of God. Somebody say, that's an exchange. Come on, y'all understand exchange. You ever bought something and it didn't fit right? You kept your receipt, you took the receipt and the box, sometimes you take it back in a brown paper bag. You took, you took whatever the item was back, some of y'all have done that, right? Some of y'all have probably done like me and taken it back in a bag that wasn't even related to the store. But you give them your receipt. And they make an exchange. They take what didn't work and they give you what works better. If the shoes was too tight, they give you the size that now feels right. But what they do with your old receipt is they cross it out and they staple it on the back. In other words, Always old is behind new. Never let your old life overtake your new life. Never let what you used to be be more than who you are right now. There is an exchange that has occurred. When it don't fit, you take it back. Tell somebody, tell them your old life don't fit no more. Send it back. Tell him, send it back. When the devil wants to bring it up at you, tell him, send it back. Yeah. See, see, this exchange occurred. It's what happens. Check this out. Check, uh, next, next slide. I got two more and I'm done. Go have you out of here in three minutes. Next one. Y'all know what that is? We watched it on evening news on Monday night. The cathedral at Notre Dame 
in Paris, France, was burning like an inferno out of control. It was burning and we saw the spire fall down off of the top of the cathedral. But the next day, this is the next morning, they thought the whole place had been destroyed. But the cross was still standing. I came to tell you, you might think that your life is all jacked up, but the cross is still standing in your life. The blood has not lost its power. The blood, there was an exchange at the cross, down at the cross, where I first saw the light. And the burdens of my soul, it was there I received. And now, last slide and I'm done. Do you hear what I'm saying? You can't go back and change the beginning. What's done is done. You can't go back and change that. But you can. Somebody say, I can. Say, I can. Start right where I am. And change Does anyone be in Christ? They are a... Old things are... Behold... Come on, let's give God a praise. Is anybody in Christ in here? Yes, Hallelujah! Oh, yeah. For if anyone is in Christ, he's a new, something that has never been before. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Well, I received that for myself. <laughs>